Hello everybody, this is episode number seven and I had a bit a big pleasure last weekend on Saturday to play with uh, my band called Rock Anarchy live in Mainz, Germany um, as a streaming concert, but we actually had 50 people sitting in the audience and this feels so great. We had a little um, voting for which of the songs that we play uh, you would be interested. Um, my band does a lot of, um, I would call it cover tunes, but we do interpretations. You know, for me the story is um, when you play a song of somebody else, try to be yourself and don't be just 100% cloning the original. Um, because I learned this from my Jimi Hendrix episodes and concerts. If you try to be like Jimi Hendrix, you are number two and this is, you are a loser. So the only way to compensate that is that you be yourself, you do your thing with the songs that people know and then of course you have some people arguing, yeah, it's not original and maybe it's uh, not totally authentic, but if you are authentic, you can give your best and this is what people love. Um, yeah, in this episode I will show you my big pedal board, which is the one that I used on the gig um, last Saturday and on or basically all my gigs because that's the pedal board I use for I think the last five or six years, um, at least since day one when the M1 was on my pedal board. In, and it has a lot of um, little stomp boxes that I used in the past uh, with my tube amp with the Triumph. Um, um, and yeah, I will explain some of the pedal board. And then in the second half, we have our new test station that uh, brings you the Mercury edition side by side to the Iridium edition. Um, on a new 2x12 cabinet called the Twin Cap Mark II, which is specially designed for, you know, tighter, uh, faster bass. It's, it's, it's kind of a metal cabinet, more in your face sound. But if you have it laid down, we have like the Twin Cap can be used horizontal or vertical. And if you have uh, the horizontal use, it, it's on the floor and that's a nice way for that cabinet to be um, connected to a classic amp as well. So um, it shows the differences between the M1 Mercury edition and the M1 Iridium edition quite well. And um, yeah, we have a test station that will go out to selected dealers and uh, we would like you to go to these dealers and you know check out the two amps so you can find out what or which amp you like better or what the sound uh, you like best and um, get a feel for the amps because the biggest problem about an amp like this is like you know it looks so different is this like a, the real deal how does it feel and you have to plug in and you have to play through a real cabinet and then you immediately will understand this is the real deal and this is how it feels right. Yeah, anyway, um, I have a little question and lottery to start with. Um, I will talk about the song Purple Rain a bit um, since people voted that um, as the songs I should talk about. Um, there's other songs I will talk about anyway because I love them a lot too. And um, but first, here's the lottery. Um, Purple Rain was composed by Prince. Prince was a big thing in my twenties and uh, teenage uh, years. Um, and there was a band called the New Power Generation, and there was a female guitar player. And she is using the M1 right now too. What's the name of the female guitar player that used to play with Prince? If you know the answer, you will win this DVD. And first one, first serve. So let's see 
if we have a winner. Okay, I will play uh, a few chords and maybe explain what's going on with this beautiful song. Um, you know that the original is in B flat major. Oops, I need a little bit of um, drive here. And the first chord is already magic. It's like... Okay, on the original recording there was used a chorus or kind of a flanger. I used my small stone. Ah, we have a few answers here, but they are all wrong. Yeah. Oh, the first one. Julian. It's Kate Dyson. Um, yeah, she is, or she was the guitar player with um, Prince in those days. You can look it up on the internet which years, you know, Prince had many bands and he had many uh, lineups for his bands as well. Um, but I know her for a long time and, you know, she is a smart guitar player and she's got a great sense of rhythm, you know, first, but hey, she can solo as well. She's killer um, and she sings, yeah, yeah, Kat Dyson, that's her name. So uh, yeah, this one goes to Julian. You will get this um, when you're home. Um, yeah, we need your address, but uh, we can sort this out later. Um, let me talk a little bit about that song, since we, we talk about uh, stuff of music as well. I will come to my pedal board very uh, soon. Um, when you listen to the original version in this B flat major, the problem is if you play a three piece band like I do with my rock anarchy, you know, we can't use the open strings. So we do a very super lazy, easy thing. <laughs> we simply transpose it to A, a half step down. Okay. So this would be the easy version, having like an A major, F minor with the open um, E and B string and E major and then like a D9, D sus 2 or whatever you call that chord. Um, but the nice thing about harmonies is if you have certain intervals that give you that kind of longing feeling, you know, it's like... There's the 9 there's uh, the, th the three. <laughs> and here's a trick that I do sometimes. I do the country style with, with a bending behind the nut. And here I use a um, E with a nine, E major nine. And then the D, the lazy version is you play that chord. The real version is like you play the D with this beautiful nine and the, th uh, the three. Um, okay. And then of course you can play it in different registers like Hendrix style. So you can feel, uh, fiddle around and then of course there's this Curtis Mayfield or you know uh, R&B licks that you can throw in. That's one thing. 
The other thing I like to do, of course, is like Prince's solo already was killer on the original version, but um, I wouldn't say I spice it up. I just have a, 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 a few speedy uh, things. I try to have, you know, those long throwing notes, like a, uh, you know. <laughs> Yeah, you notice that I still have my reflex on, and that's pre the amp, at a very low setting. When you see me playing live, I, I always control the volume of that, and sometimes the, the delay time as well. Um, but what I do for my hero sound in that song is I use a sound which is this one, and this is what I would call the Eric Johnson Memorial Sound, which is using the real tube overdrive in front of the vintage channel. So for me, everything is based on the vintage channel. That's my favorite channel. And then I have a ton, a big palette of boosters that I can bring in. And for the Prince song, even with the delay on, you hear the delay. I add, it's getting a bit noisy, the real tube, okay? And this is what it's doing. So this is the amp, and this is the extra gain and mids coming from the real tube. does sound a little bit like a fuzz, but on the other hand, you know, it has this violin mids, and this is because I have cascaded overdrive. And that's a beauty that he discovered. We didn't invent the whole thing. I mean, you know, people like Jimi Hendrix did that decades ago, and um, we just inspired about having, you know, like one overdrive with a certain amount of gain going into an overdriven amp and yeah for this super rich uh, singing lead tones okay so this was the shortcut but let me explain my big pedal board i announced this to be in this episode the lineup here is pretty simple this is guitar input into my wawa it's a george dennis um, this is a Czech company. I'm not sure if they still exist, but it's an optical wah, which means um, there's a photo resistor kind of thing, and um, it's not the typical potentiometer that kind of gets scratchy, which we all know from the Vox. Um, so um, it has a true bypass. So. When I press here, or I mean, I have to really 
I have a lot of pressure on here. <laughs> Can't do it with my hand. I'm not strong enough. Um, so this is my my wah. So what I like about this wah is it sounds very dark. And the guy, um, his name is George Burgestein, who is the designer of this pedal. Uh, I think he's from the Czech Republic. Um, he used to have a Vava version for bass. And I liked it. And the reason for liking that was very simple, because me playing three-piece bands, when I was using a, cry, a standard crybaby, you know, it's so dramatic bass loss. There's only those scream sounds, which are great uh, for like the streets of San Francisco and some other sounds. But in, in the three piece, I was missing some of the low end. And this... It's not so dramatic, but it's very warm and it kind of... Um, doesn't change the overall frequencies of the guitar too much. That's why I love this pedal. So then you can see the cable goes into my looper kit. So next element in, um, on the pedal board is the looper kit. The looper kit is controlled by the remote one. You can see this cable and this cable um, gives you the signal of all the four loops, the in and the out, to the remote. And the remote has, um, there's a little um, PCB inside the remote, which you can, which comes with a looper kit. You have to install it. And then the signal is being switched on this PCB that is inside the remote one. And the remote one will memorize the settings of the loops, which of the loops are active, only one or two or three or any combination. And uh, also the remote one will memorize the settings of the amp one. So the, the rem remote one is kind of the brain um, that controls everything on that board. So. Now, one thing is a bit bizarre. I have only four loops and I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Ah, well, this is a seven pedals. Um, hmm. um, yeah, of course, you could have only one pedal per loop. Um, but I was thinking in a different direction. I, I have kind of um, pedals that I like in pairs. For instance, this Wampler and the small stone, they, they, are, they share one loop. So it's the Wampler into the small stone and they are on one loop. And then the real tube is only in one loop. And then, um, which one is, is left? One more is left. Uh, fuck, I have to analyze my signal path. It's been years ago uh, since I've done my pedal board. Um, yeah, let's see. So this is the input and this is the output. Um, but to be honest, I'm having the um, reflex in the loop all the time. The leap, leap, I'm used to, to, to have that pedal and I don't need it in, in the loop switching. So the loop switching is only good if you want to get a pedal out of the signal path. And me being co-designer of this pedal, I was very, very keen on getting a good bypass. So this bypass on the Replex is one of the best bypass, um, buffered bypasses that I know of. And therefore I like it in the signal path. Yeah, and as I explained in last episode, there's so many things that I do with the reflex. One is just using the tube. So this is like, you can see no, no reverb volume. There's a reverb built in, but I've, it's a crappy reverb, I show you. <laughs> so, this one sounds much better. So I have no reverb from, from the uh, reflex. I just use the tube here. And then 
Of course, I have the long single head delay. Yeah, just beautiful. Um, on this side, I have um, a shorter time, which I use. This um, 316 kind of U2-ish delay. And the modifications I've done to this pedal um, is because it's not programmable, I simply put in trim ports here, and I have like a selector switch that switches between these three trim ports, so I can preset different times uh, with a screwdriver. I had to do this when I was gigging with um, other bands where we need to be spot on and um, I had to have timed delays, so I could kind of preset that here. Um, so this switch kind of replaces that port and the pot um, here is then replaced with these three trim pots. Um, but there's no big modification. So, the other switches is, oops, dry kill. So now it's only delay. I've done this because I use that pedal also a lot in the studio um, for mixing. It's a killer pedal. I, you know, if you have a good delay, you want to use it. And I use this on anything. On my pedal board, I use this in the live mix uh, or in, on, in the studio for, for mixing my live DVDs and everything. It's, it's even on the vocals. It's everywhere. And the other switch here is changing a capacitor on the tube um, to have different kind of high end. So this is like one and this is two that's a bit darker and this is a bit brighter the brighter version is kind of more neutral the darker version is like the real authentic um, echoplex that we try to model with this pedal um, but besides that it's all stock uh, it's nice and rusty and it still works which is great um, so then I have this pedal here which is also kind of a okay switch off the replex It's not really giving you extra gain, it's more giving you extra warmth. And that's a homemade pedal which comes from my old memory man that I had on an earlier pedal board. And the memory man pedal already brings you some warmth just because of the preamp. And that's kind of what I have in there. So it's one element that I use also. And talking about colorations, there is Reusenzehn. Thomas Reusenzehn is a German tube guy from Frankfurt. And um, in the end, what is it? Um, it is a simple one tube device with a so-called cathode follower stage um, and it is something that colors the sound. Yeah, the replex, all the stuff I'm talking about now is in front of the amp. In my effects loop there's only this digital delay. Switch off, oops, now. No delay and 
that's the DD2. But I'll talk about this later. Um, so let's, let's continue with the signal path here. So what's the thing about voice and scene? Actually, do you hear a difference? I do, but it's sub, you know, subliminal. It's just this little extra sparkle somewhere. But you know, um, I had all these pedals on my previous pedal board and they made probably a bit more sense on that pedal board because on the previous pedal board I had a long cable driving um, the signal from the pedal board to my tube amp that was standing behind me on top of my cabinet. So that cable was whatever, six, eight meters long. And, um, you know, I had this pedal and I liked that and I liked that pedal. And of course, you know, one day I found some mixture of all that stuff and I, I, I simply used everything I used before and just replaced my amp with the amp one. And here we are, and I still like it. It's kind of a good thing. But to be honest, if if I would go straight from with the guitar into the input, like I have a good tone, uh, maybe even a better tone. <laughs> Let's find out. So. <laughs> Well, that sounds pretty good and dynamic and I think this sounds pretty good too and a bit noisy. So is it better? Well, it's different, but it's, I wouldn't tell you it's better. It's, I got all these pedals because I got them on the board, <laughs> I don't mind, and they do something. Um, now let's talk about what I'm doing as kind of real effects. Okay, the real tube I explained a little bit, but uh, maybe we rev revisit the whole thing. It's so noisy that yeah, it's it's humming because it's again it's a real tube. Um, but here is the beauty of it. Um, on bypass, you hear my so my sound. Nice, great, plexi-style tone. So, and this is what Eric Johnson also used, is kind of this pedal, there's a rec version of it. I have it too, it's somewhere here. Uh, no, next time, we, we, we can do a e full episode on <laughs> real tube overdrives. I have a big collection of that stuff. So, okay, back. <laughs> So, you know, one, one thing is this kind of mid-hump, almost like a tube screamer, but I prefer to a tube screamer. I do have the tube screamer, um, but it has some more alive over, overdrive. It has, uh, it has something that is, talks more, that's more dynamic, musically dynamic. Of course, you know, if something is overdriven, it's not dynamic, but what I put in as a signal from me as a player, this pedal turns out to make a more colorful tone compared to a Tube Screamer. That's why I love this pedal and I put that one on my pedal board. So the drop is similar. When I go back to, you know, um, use the the um, 
looper kit to make the bypass on this because this kind of stays on all the time but the looper kit kind of switches is off the signal pass otherwise we would have that kind of humming noise every time and you would do a tap dance to get rid of all that it's not possible you need something like a pedal switcher to control this many pedals and to have a clean signal pass um, so the thing about the real tube is the tone it's like So this is kind of my vintage territory high gain. I could use, you know, some of the m ones channels, like the modern channel here, and it's... It's equally rich. So there's nothing I would, this is just a touch woodier, okay? I'm a nerd, I have to admit, but this is how it is. So this is the modern channel on the Mercury edition. And this is the real tube in front of the winter channel. Hey, it's all a matter of taste. I like them both. This is why I have them both programmed into my remote one. And um, the modern channel for me is the channel that is, you know, the real tube maybe sounds more like a violin. But if I go to the modern channel, I'm simply louder and I'm, you know, more in front. If I need the extra push over the cliff, <laughs> which was the episode on Spinal Tap, Da, da, da. This one goes to 11. I put the modern channel on, you know, and I've, if I try to be, you know, more like a classical musician, nice and peaceful and elegant, uh, maybe I use um, the real tube. Okay, um, so basically, ah, I forgot my clean channel here, which is. <laughs> And here is my magic combination is the clean channel and the replex. And okay, with the delay again. So this is kind of always at hand. This is why it's in the first row on my pedal board, just next to the presets, which is the central element. Um, now I show you my other presets. This one is the all included clean channel, which includes now the more yellow comp, the small stone phaser and the wampler. Maybe I switch off everything first, which is usually not the case. So you see where my starting point is. Simple, clean. It's, it's, it's probably... It's a little less volume that I programmed into that because I use now um, the stuff to boost it. The yellow comp. And now I can dial in as much compression I want or as much volume I need. So I can have full compression.
This is one from Jerry Donahue. Um, I show you this lick, it's killer. Um, you, you play E on the, what is it? Uh, 12, ninth fret, ninth fret, G string, okay? So. Then you bend it up to F sharp and you make sure the B string slips underneath the finger as well. And once both strings kind of collide, you grab them both at once and you, you know, you turn the direction of the bending from downwards to upwards and you have grabbed both notes. So the that's the trick. If you want to hear great bends, Jerry Donahue is the man. He's the kind of behind the nut bender as well. Um, so we get lost here. Ah, this was the compressor. <laughs> Another thing that I like to do with the clean channel, the compressor, and sometimes the reflex is another solo tone, which is another brick in the wall. So I just increase the drive here and do my, I'm Mr. Gilmore. <laughs> So this is a little bit of this drive here from the reflex into the compressor into overdriving so the compressor doesn't do any overdrive saturation. It just gives you extra level and extra compression and if you find the right sweet spot for it's great to have these kind of voxy tone. So this is a real small stone with all the fuck ups of a small stone. I have so many of these, one here, one on the board and another two, three somewhere. And I found the small stone is my favorite phaser. The small stone uh, by Electro Harmonix is, has the best mids, is the best all rounder for me. Other people prefer the MXR, you know, phase 90, phase 100, phase whatever. Um, there's a lot of great phasers around, um, but that's my favorite. Um, and it's great on Fender Rhodes as well. That's the very typical Fender Rhodes. So when I put this in the signal path, first thing we, we, we face is a volume drop. And then to compensate this, I use the plexi drive, the one plus plexi drive. So, and once I have an extra drive pedal on the pedal board, I can use that as slight overdrive again. So this is me being the chef that is adding a touch of overdrive here and a touch of overdrive there and blends the whole thing, you know, cascading it together. Let me show you what's the plexi drive doing. It's a bypass. And this is on. 
just rounds up the signal and then adds another overtone thing. And just in cooking with these three ingredients, like I can boost with a reflex. less of the plexi drive and of course the yellow comp I can get anywhere already And then with the reflex, my magic carpet comes alive. And the small stone lets it fly. This was the magic combination of like compressor, plexi drive, small stone. Ah, if I leave the whole thing on in my next preset number seven, I'm getting rid of the comp, but I'm switching to the vintage channel. So just for you to compare, this was the setting of these two or even three pedals for my clean channel. <laughs> And now, this is the same pedals in front of the vintage, but not with the compressor. I compressor is out because the compressor is bypassed with the looper kit. So now, reflex, small stone. It's just as beautiful as the other one. Um, but I have more gain on tap and then I can go into my uh, solos and it's easy. I can go...
the real tube, the noisy boy. <laughs> So you heard about this pedal, this pedal, this pedal, this pedal, this pedal. This is the magic secret. It's just a power supply. That's uh, my custom made power supply since I need AC for the tube pedals and I need DC for the transistor pedals here. And um, instead of having three different of these wall socket power supplies, um, I decided to have one that is custom built for my pedal board that delivers all the power that I need for my pedals on this uh, pedal board. That makes sense. And um, yeah, it's only one power supply for all my pedals. Okay, this, these were the pedals in front. And by the way, I have this pitchback, um, what is it, cork tuner. So if I Hit this, it's mute and I can tune the guitar silently. Double checker, it's always good to have a tuner on board. And if anything gets un out of control, just use the tuner. Uh, so, and that's kind of the last thing in front of the input. In my effects loop, there is the DD2, which is a boss digital delay, but it's the very old school um, DD2 is the second generation of BOSS um, digital delays and these can still be modded. So I like the darker repeats of the delay. So here you hear the, the sound. This should be the original sound. You hear there's a bit more repeats going on and they are a bit brighter. That's the modification. So you, the repeat is filtered, so we have a warmer tone in the repeats, and of course, it's not getting that many repeats anymore. And that's something that David Gilmore uses. If it's good for David Gilmore, it's good for me. So this switch for me is kind of the normal switch and the ballad. If I need, you know, the, the delays longer, I have it on this position, and then this is like the standard. Here only when I stop that this is on and on my clean channel that's on bypass so you know I can there's no difference so this is already kind of switched off with the remote but I leave it on all the time so my clean sound is dry and funky only has the reverb uh, and the delay is automatically on on the lead channels. If I need to have it off, I can simply press that foot switch and go for that. So for me, the concept of a pedal board can be total control with just one remote control like this, but I'm hybrid. It's like I have my presets here and I still have some of the knobs um, and switches um, accessible while playing. Um, the board would not be as big as it is now because it's only because it has grown with me over, I don't know, 15, 20 years playing in different bands, having different um, music and now, you know, it's my all and everything board. Ah, um, actually, 
I don't know what I do with number eight. It's free. Let's see here the sound what's on there. Uh huh. Sounds like a phaser. Number nine is definitely revolution. This is how much gain and how loud can I get. So this is my this is my last chord of the show program. Okay, and the nine is using the classic channel. Um, yeah, and as I mentioned earlier, I have the modern channel on the four, which is maybe even more. <laughs> Yeah, so this is even louder on the four, but it's woodier. Um, number nine is um, a nice gain channel as well. And I can do a lot with my volume control on all my presets. So uh, this was my big pedal board. Ah, one little thing I wanted to, to comment about the yellow comp, uh, which is this fellow here. Um, yeah, actually I had this pedal, the diamond um, compressor on this pedal board, but one day I switched to the blue box and um, the blue box is what I'm using. This is all I'm using. And this is also what I used on the last live concert. If you see the very end of the stream, I made a comment through the microphone, but it was not on anymore and uh, unplugged the XLR from here. Um, yeah, we have another blue box down there, which I, we are using now, um, which comes in place when we do the AB um, testing station comparison in a minute. Um, one thing about this compressor, it's yellow, the other one is yellow, and I couldn't hear a difference. So I got this first when this came out. And now I use the yellow comp because it's smaller, uses less real estate on the pedal board and does the same thing for me. Um, just micro knobs and for me as good. And here you see my spare DD2 with the modification again and uh, the broken, <laughs> what is it, effect level. Uh, yeah, Rock and roll life has... Um, tortured this pedal. Um, so if you do have any more questions on this big pedal board, yeah, feel free to ask and write in the comments. Um, I, I have a look here. Um, so the replex is pre the amp one and the digital delay is post. Correct. This is in the effects loop and this is in front of the amp one. So be careful with the amount of delay you add to the si signal when you have something in front of the amp, especially when you use overdrive. But that's something I'm doing for years, which I love. And uh, it requires me always to fiddle around. But uh, if, if for me, it's magic. Just listen. When I have an overdriven sound like this, like <laughs> that's all good. But when I have like a tube tape delay in front of them. 
just the right amount or actually all the way up and then. Yeah, so this is my main control here. I should have a big knob on that one. Um, yeah. Okay, next question. Um, hi Thomas, which reference amps did you use as inspiration for the M1 Mercury edition channels? I've heard the vintage is based on Marshall GTM45, but wondering about the clean classic modern too. Well, um, the Mercury edition vintage channel is, I do have a GTM45 and that was my reference for the first amp one for the silver edition or the one with no name, <laughs> the M1 with no name. Um, the, um, my, my Plexi, uh, black flag Plexi, you know, there's Plexis from 1967 that had this GTM logo with black and these are super sort of the amps now. I don't know, people pay crazy money for it. I bought it for a reasonable price. And um, yeah, the thing is, um, the black flag is maybe the more universal amp and I use that um, f as reference for the, the vintage channel on the Mercury edition. On the classic channel, it's still the same GCM 800 and my Triamp using Ketna, which is in between uh, VH4 and the GCM 800 and all these classic nice high gain sounds, which is the bread and butter warmth of rock and roll. Um, that's the reference for the classic channel. On the modern channel, I had um, a couple of different amps, a Soldano SLO 100, which is kind of the sound that you get when you have the, the custom control counterclockwise, and then some kind of angle amps, um, you know, the, the, the typical angle metal, a bit scooped, but tight high gain tones, um, were kind of inspirational for the modern channel on the Mercury edition. On the clean, I have a bunch of different Fender amps and uh, it's my Fender Super Reverb that I like a lot. Um, there's a Fender Princeton, there's a Fender Twin next door. All these amps are kind of, and a Fender Bassman, um, because I like the, the way it a basement breaks up. Um, but I found out that most Fender amps, ele the electronics of the amps, they sound pretty similar. It's more about the volume they put out and how they compress. So it's, um, yeah, it's Fenderish on the on one side and it's a bit more voxy on the other side or, or Marshally even there, there's some beautiful Marshall clean tones as well. I mean, a GTM 45 is a super nice clean amp. I mean, it just has a Marshall logo and you wouldn't think it's great for clean. But here's the truth. Sultans of Swing by Mark Knopfler and the Dire Straits was never played on a Fender amp in the studio. It was played on a Marshall GTM 45. I got it firsthand. Only in the photo session you will see the Fender amps. Um, okay, anyway. Uh, did I confuse you? Yes, I did. Doesn't matter. <laughs> Sometimes rock and roll is a bit confusing. So these are the amps that I had like as a reference. Okay, um, next question. Do you use the tube factor on this board? My favorite amp, one boost. Not on this board, but I love the tube factor. I do have it in the shelf somewhere over there. And um, I even have it with the Oko mod, for those who know the Oko mod. Oko is a guy from East Germany that also de designs his Diabolo drive and he did a modification on it. Or maybe it's downstairs. Uh, yeah. Um, so the tube factor is a killer combination, yes. Uh, the, the tube factor was a, a killer combination for me 
with um, aha somebody found it yeah ta -ta -ta -ta. Um, the original tube factor um, does have only a drive output and a voicing and these kn knobs and the switch are some extra modification done by Oko. Um, so he made that, per, uh, that pedal a bit more versatile. Um, and you know, of course I was curious, so I use it. Um, it's probably set to the standards <laughs> settings because I designed the pedal the way I liked it. And, uh, but this is more flexible, or maybe not. Um, let's put it that way. I still love the pedal. It's a great pedal that works with any amp, but it actually works very well with amps that I designed because it's like, you know, all that experience that I gained with the combination of these pedals I've done all my life. And this is kind of uh, doing similar things than these pedals, this kind of pedal collection on that pedal board. And it's tubes and it's dynamic and it's killer. There's nothing wrong. So that's the tube factor. Um, next question. Can the looper kit from the remote one have both some loops pre and ah, pre, um, the preamp and some post the preamp? No. The looper kit is a super simple device and it's for a reason. I wanted to have the most pristine and um, transparent sound with full signal integrity before the input. If you have ever heard the different sound of guitar cables or patch cables, you wonder why these patch cables are white. Yeah, some Teflon magic. Some, somebody had some leftover esoteric shit and it gave it for, for cheesy money. And they actually sound good. That's why I have them on the pedal board. They are not super flexible. But you hear all that stuff that is in front of the guitar amp's input. Doesn't matter what brand, what model, anything before the guitar input of the guitar amplifier is very sensitive because this is high impedance and uh, the tone changes. So for me, um, it's important to have a super quality and the integrity of the sound should be guaranteed by the, a pedal switcher like our looper kit in combination with the remote one. And this is super simple, in, out, so guitar here, amp there, and the rest is for the pedals. So you can have the shortest connection if you don't use your pedals or you just bring in the pedals that you need and get rid of all the other shit because you can hear it. It's noisy, it's humming, it's any kind of uh, stuff that's it's not good for your signal quality. So. And this is only in the loop. And I'm using a simple delay anyhow. And therefore, I don't need any switching for my effects loop besides the on-off function. Um, some people work a lot with post effects, which is cool. And post effects, um, if I would use post effects, I would probably use something like an H9 or, you know, some devices that can do, you know, high-end quality effects and then use the MIDI here and switch the effects in one single device. It takes some time to program it, but it would have um, a great um, easy setup. I mean, it takes time to program it, but once, once it's done, that's all you need. You press a button here and that's all, all there is. And therefore, I think a loop switcher um, in the effects loop is not so common. I mean, of course, the market offers you tons of products and there are some 
kind of MIDI controllers with built-in pedal switching and even for pre and post and uh, the gig rig for instance from the UK is a very very high um yeah pedal switcher and MIDI controller that could also be used uh, in combination with Amp1. It's a perfect combination if you want to go all the way. I just do my thing. <laughs> um, Carsten Funk, Funk uh, is the looper kit using relays? Yes, it's using gold plated relays which are on the PCB right here under my finger. Um, next question, a question about the built-in boost, yeah, which is this one. Um, is it more like a clean boost or more like a tube screamer? Good question, because it can be both. At lower settings, the boost is more or less, um, I would call it a sparkle boost. It, it enhances a little bit the high end. Um, you know what? I, I simply unplug the whole pedal so we know it's only coming from the built-in boost and not from anything else. So this is guitar into clean. No boost. So the boost now is kind of at middle position. Now I, I go back for low setting. So it adds a little presence here. Off. Okay, but Tube Screamer, I crank it, crank it all the way up. This is Wait a minute, is this the end? There should be maximum somewhere here. So. Yeah, you can hear there is already some gain. And of course, if I make the amp a bit hotter. This is always almost boring. So the built-in boost already is a killer and I like them both. I like the built-in boost, I like my pre-boosts, but I'm not using my pedals like real boosters. I usually have them just as a different color. But you know what? Let's get it back to normal, which is my middle position here. And the sound also. Seven is my setting because tomorrow I have another gig <laughs> and it's always shit if you have changed all the knobs on your pedal board. You go on stage and nothing is like, ah. Okay, so this was um, the built in boost. Tube Screamer, I have to, to tell you, it's a bit more mid rangey and it has the option of more like gain, more drive. Um, um, but I kind of prefer the way the boost is in, in the M1. If you like a Tube Screamer, get a Tube Screamer. It's a fantastic pedal. In the Iridium edition, our black M for the metal guys, the internal boost is more Tube Screamer-ish. Why? Because the metal guys, they want that mids focused in front of the amp but I will show you that later. Okay, next question. When I turn down the gain from my clean sound, it's not loud enough to keep up with my, what's the end of the lead sound? I use a modern channel for high gain lead. Well, um, the balance between clean and overdrive um, is determined by a few factors. First, the master volume, second, the clean volume, and third, the overdrive master. Um, if, if, the, if the clean volume is not loud enough, you have to increase master first. So if the master and the clean volume is the level that makes you sound 
okay, then you can dial in the gain and the amount of master volume for the drive channel. In that way, you can match the both sounds. So the clean channel might be low and then you have to be very low on the um, output of the drive channels as well when the master overall master is set to a high um, position. But this is a matter of taste. I was explaining in another episode that the clean sound changes a lot when the clean volume is on lower settings. I use it on 7, but if you play a humbucking guitar, it's probably good to have it like on 5 or even less. And um, okay, the humbucker guitar puts out more volume by nature, but um, let's put it that way. You have to find the tone of the clean sound here first, then adjust the master volume. And mind that Fender amps, traditional Fender amps, don't have that master volume, which means they would be like on 8 or 10. Uh, so don't be afraid to have the master higher if you need that headroom for your clean tone. And then you have to adjust the master of the overdrive kind of low. I am a different way. I am very hot on the clean volume with my boosters. So you can see my master on gain on the drive channel this is on 10. But this is how I'm this kind of gainy guy um, or bluesy guy that everything has to has to overdrive a little bit. Okay, next question. Bruno, wasn't the GTM4 the European baseman? Yes. Um, GTM45 is um, the first Marshall ever. And the story goes back to Jim Marshall in the 60s, I think it was 63, where he had his music shop in London and he had all these famous guitar players like Pete Townsend. Uh, he wasn't that famous by that time. Um, but swinging London was, was, was the big thing back then. And they all bought Fender amps, but they couldn't get enough product from the States. Back in these days, they had different issues. And Jim Marshall simply decided to make a copy of that amp, but then of course he was sourcing British components, British tubes, British transformers, and so the GTM45 was a, a Fender basement copy. There's only one value different, <laughs> it's one capacitor and the rest is the same. Um, but it sounds different because of the components. So who cares? They started the British blues and rock invasion with these amps, but it all came from the US with the Fender amps. Okay, next question. Thomas, what fuzz do you use for Hendrix? Silicon or germanium? I do have a bunch of fuzzes and I think, which one is it? Uh, I have um, on my Hendrix board, man, I think it's a silicon fuzz, but I might be wrong. <laughs> the one that is not as fuzzy as the other one. Um, it's the, what is it? It's the Dunlop, uh, it's a Dunlop one. I have, a, I have the big one and I have the small one. I can't tell you, sorry. Uh, next guy, um, yeah. Hi Thomas, can I integrate the remote one with other MIDI device? I'm currently using Fractal FX8. Multi effects to switch the amp one using scenes. Ah, okay, on MIDI with the Fractal FX, um, I'd like to use the remote one also. Um, let's put it that way: the remote one is needs to be connected with amp one, so there is kind of a its own control protocol that goes in between amp one and remote one. And then the remote one sends out MIDI and this MIDI can be used to do other switching on other MIDI devices. Um, I'd like to use the remote also. Yeah, 
so thinking about the whole thing is like <laughs> you could have, oh, this is kind of overkill. The FX8, which is a MIDI controller by itself with like this many switches already and um, built in effects, which is a uh, killer for the four cable method. And you could use the remote, but the remote needs to be connected with the quarter inch plug to the remote socket here and the MIDI out of the uh, remote has to switch the FX8. In that case, you face one problem. If you switch something on the FX8, it's not switching the M1 again. So thinking about the whole thing, I wouldn't say it's a great idea. Stick with the FX8 and be happy. <laughs> um, the reason for that is we can only have one MIDI input at, um, yeah, if we don't go any special modifications. No, we don't do it, too complicated. FX8 is a beautiful product and I, yeah, use that and the remote is also beautiful, but I would say either this way or the other way. So you work with the scenes with your FX8. And if you need a pedal switcher, if that's what you want in extension to the FX8, the MIDI out on the FX8 could have uh, some nice pedal switching devices. There are some MIDI devices that give you like four loops like what we have here. And they have they use a simple MIDI input and they have kind of a learn function. So you could do the same in that direction. Okay. Um, next question. I believe your Rotosphere is the best Leslie pedal ever made. Thank you. Uh, would you consider reselling it in a similar package? Um, in a smaller package. Um, Let's put it that way. Yes, it's a killer Leslie simulator. There's the, the ventilator and there's some other kind of great pedals around. But imagine we, we did this pedal and it was like one of the first ones. And it's definitely a nice combination of a tube driven Leslie simulator. There used to be Dynacord CLS 22 and 220 um, in the past, but these were not tube driven. And the, the Rotosphere is the best combination of the tube stage and the Leslie simulation. So, I, well, it's, it's killer and it's used by all the great names. It's used by my hero, Jeff Beck. So there's nothing wrong with that pedal besides it's a bit noisy. Um, okay, next question here. Uh, Mick Rose, hi Thomas. Where is your range master? My range master is downstairs and you will hear it in my next episode because we will have the red special guitar next week. It finally showed up and I can show you the queen sound and this is an essential ingredient for the queen tone. And there's the range master and it will reappear next week. Okay. I think that's plenty of stuff for now. We will have the second part of this is showing you M1 Mercury Edition versus Iridium Edition with my AB switching system. And to make this whole thing work, we have to tear this down, get the test station up, and this will take a few seconds, minutes, and we will put in some video, see you in a minute with the next big section of comparing two amps.
Okay, what we have here now is the new test station for M1 Iridium Edition and Mercury Edition. The big question is always been asked, what is the difference between these two amps? And we are using uh, my AB switcher. So the guitar goes into this input and then there is one that goes to one amp and two which goes to another amp. And I have a pedal here to switch between both amps. So, and here we are. This is now vintage channel, full gain, same amount of volume and middle position of all the three EQ bands. And so this is Mercury Edition um, with a Stratocaster. And here you can hear already the kind of different character. So this is smoother and got more vintage tone. Now I switch for the Mercury. It's boomier, it's bassier. This is the vintage channel. So. So, aha, uh -huh. there's a difference. Maybe it's a big difference for you, maybe it's not a big difference for you. For me, there's a big difference. This is about smooth, warm, classic, vintage tone in the vintage channel. <laughs> This has more aggression and has more punch. The other one, this is woodier, rounder, simply nicer. And this is more aggressive. So let me switch to another guitar and see what this will bring. Uh, Les Paul. Okay, I killed it. No. <laughs> so here comes my little go top. Thank you. 
I think you can hear the difference. And this is how close we can get using the two amps, using the same speaker simulation, using the same guitar, using the same EQ settings, but you can hear and maybe feel the difference in character. So amp one Iridium is simply, you know, more masculine. This is like, you know, I, I got balls. I'm a bit more aggressive. Um, and the, the thing is, um, maybe you like it better with humbuckers. Uh, maybe you like it better with humbuckers because it's sweeter here. It's about what you prefer. It's nothing is better. It's just what you choose is better for you. And this is why we made this testing station here. So you can go to your dealer and you have both M side by side with the same speaker cabinet and you can hear very simply plug in on one side or on the other side, dial in some tones and find out which character suits you and your guitar the best. That's super, super simple. And of course, you can find differences in all the channels. This was simply the vintage channel because we have no custom controls. We have simply nothing. Gain on full, same volume and the tone stack kind of neutral in the middle. So this is already what you can hear in the, the basic sound character difference of both uh, amps. And I'm not saying that um, one is better. It's just, hey, there's a beauty in every... So when I play this... Ah, oh, maybe I give you the full reverb on both because they sound also slightly different. This is the Mercury edition and that's the Iridium. Back to this one. Okay, it's more reverb, but more mid-range, more... Hotter and, and simply not as bluesy, but you can blue, play the blues, it's good. Let me play a little bit on the Iridium because sometimes you might think I'm so much a fan of the Mercury, which is true because for me and my Strat and my vintage tones, but hey, let's. <laughs> So this is using the boost um, on the Iridium edition and you can hear it, 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 it brings up the mids in a nice way, you know, it talks more. Without. Yeah, and this is what I talked about, the tube screamer mids early on. Oh, 
schöner Ton. Vintage on the Iridium Edition. So what's wrong about that? It For me, as a guy that plays, you know, classic rock and blues, and it's a, a killer brown sound, I think. <laughs> Let's switch back for the Mercury edition and see how that the sound. Ah, no boost, that's hard. Okay, when I when you come for more gain, it's it's difficult to play less gain. But so see when when I have it cleans up a bit nicer. It's softer. For the iridium. Yeah, they're both great. Hey, <laughs> there's nothing wrong with both amps. And as you can see, you can play similar music on both amps. But now when we come to the harder territory, like let's go for the classic channel, maybe you can hear more differences. I switch off the boost first and see what happens. <laughs> So this is when both uh, tone controls are down. Now I go to the clockwise setting and then there should be more difference. Let's see. So, this is a big difference. And here you can hear, this has the, what we call the German metal, the big, 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 big. At this point, I'm not touching the three band tone control at all. Is I could make sound this even much better, but I'm trying to give you a real reference point. So this is neutral, this is neutral, and you just 
hear the difference in the amplifiers. <laughs> Okay, so, and then when we go for the next channel, switch off the boost, again, uh, let's see where we have the settings here. So this is Mercury at its best, high gain, tight, low end, massive gain, this is what we're hearing here. Okay, so this is the tightness you get. And of course, then we have the other side of the tone stack and we can blend from one side to the other. <laughs> This was just about the different characters of the amps. Now let's use the, the tone controls as well. So this was going to the extreme, how much massive gain we can get and how tight is the low end. And of course, the one Iridium edition was designed to go there. 
If that's your cup of tea, that's your amp. If you're more into the warmer tones, like the woodier ones, the Mercury Edition is your amp. <laughs> and there's a beauty about everything. I'm not a metal guy. Next episode, I will invite uh, somebody again um, and have him show you the differences. But here you can see what I will do with both amps and that I can sound great on both amps. And uh, there is a reason why we have both amps, why there's one amp that is more aggressive, that is more in your face, which is bigger and ballsier and, you know, yeah, this is the more modern voiced amp and this is more the traditional classic rock voiced amp. Okay, um, here's a question. Can I make the Iridium edition, the black one, less tight to sound more like uh, the Mercury? Um, yeah, we have the uh, zagging function or the power soak function and then get the power amp a bit yeah, more into the sagging um, territory. But still, you know, it's more complex. It's not only one parameter. It's a mixture of everything, of EQ, of saturation, of, you know, the point where it breaks up and overtones. And, and you could hear also on the EQ. This EQ is tailored to give you overtones that go even more into the aggressive territory, but without being fuzzy. This is more hi-fi. This has a different, softer, more elegant frequencies. But hey, it's all a matter of taste. Okay, another question here. I am using the Houston Kettner Tubeman 2 for years. I have two of them, yes. Uh, just the speaker simulation output suffers from mains hum, both units. Um, could you, could it be a design issue? Were you involved in it? Yes, I was involved. Um, a hum issue. Actually, I need to check mine. I haven't used it for years. Um, I don't think it was humming. Maybe the tube is, is, is a problem on the tube man uh, for, for hum. I have no idea. I, I wouldn't design a product that would be hum by nature. <laughs> this this makes, doesn't make any sense. Nobody, uh, nobody really likes that. Um, okay, so this is to give you an impression on what's the difference in these two M ones in the Iridium edition and the Mercury edition. And um, what else? We, I think this is why we designed the test station. And the test station will show up at some of your hopefully local dealers. Um, so you can have your own idea. And, you know, for starting points, we showed it last time already we have um, sound charts that will come with the test station. So you can have sets for single coil guitars. Um, we have different styles of music. Each set has like four uh, sounds and channels. I mean, Malcolm, Angus and Scorpion, who knows what that is. And the same we've done for the Iridium edition. So, um, there's plenty for you to try out and there's plenty um, options on the amps, you know? So, you know, if I spend some time with each amp, then, you know, I, I can find the beauty in this. Just for instance, with this guitar on the clean channel, you know, it's like killer, humbucker. This guitar is not the best guitar for clean, but this amp makes this guitar sound killer. Give it a little reverb. Remember the issue where I explained to you about this here, the block in the guitar? Look at this tiny little 
piece of metal, it's almost nothing. But that's the thing for this kind of guitar. They don't want that blocks. But this guitar is not made to be a twangy, vintage sounding guitar. But still, with this amp, I can get somewhere close. <laughs> Oh. Somewhere we fucked. Ah. Somewhere we fucked the cable. You know what? These test stations will be at your dealers very soon and you should check them out at the dealers. Um, we have a last question here. What about a special episodes about Amp1 stereo pedal board? Uh, seeing the two amps next to each other um, makes me want to have them both running at the same time. Yeah, we have a few users that uh, actually use two Amp1s. Some use it mixed. Most of them have the same models like the silver ones and use stereo setups. Um, it's, it's a bit complex. It is a bit complex um, to, to switch both at the same times. I, I use or I would recommend to use the remote one and then the remote one can switch one amp directly and the other one via MIDI and then you have best out of both worlds. You have you, you, you can do anything um, but you can also have one preamp into the two power amps and stuff. There's some, some options. That's a good theme for an episode. Okay, more questions. Does it make sense to crank the amp one as they are no full tube amps? Of course, um, and they do behave differently when cranked like a real deal. Sure, this is a nanotube 100 power amp stage. And the nanotube 100 power amp stage is a super special design that we have come up to recreate what a real tube amp is doing. And when you look at what is important for a guitar amplifier, it is to me at least the power amp is more than you think. The power amp is what makes the amp punchy, it's what makes the amp cut through, it's giving you the meat, it gives you everything what is important to be the real deal. So for me, the tube power amp stage is the reference point. And I wouldn't go on stage with anything that doesn't have that kind of quality and feel and punch. Because I don't want to suffer in a band. I want to play in a band with a real drummer and I want to be on the, lev on the same level like the, the real drummer and I want to compete with the snare drum and, and you know all the noise around me. So therefore a tube power amp stage is my reference point and what we've designed with the nanotube 100 power amp stage in our amp1 in both of them is something that will not be different if you do an AB comparison between this power amp and a classic all tube power amp. We've done this with the AB switch that I have here and uh, this is actually something for another episode which I uh, will do because all the zagging, all the compression, all the kind of breakup saturation that comes from the tube power amp stage is in our power amp stage as well. How can we do it? We use modern technology but we know what's happening in the vintage all tube designs. So in the vintage power amp you have, we all see the big power amp tubes. There's probably four power amp tubes, EO34s or 6L6s or whatever. And then they, these power amp tubes, they need a transformer because the high impedance of the tubes need to be converted into low impedance for the speaker. And before that, we have the, the phase splitter stage that kind of splits the signal into the positive and the negative wave, half of the waveform. So, and then there is a current feedback thing that comes from the speaker out and this 
interacts with everything and the speaker interacts with the power amp stage it, the, the, the whole thing is like a boat the whole thing moves and we know that i know that and the thing is when i have a classic class d power amp which is also part of this but this is not classic class class d we have our own design combining class d the nanotube and some transistor uh, schematics to get there if you have just the class D power amp, this is what other brands are using, you don't get this effect. So it will make volume, it will move air, but it will not get the tone, it will not get the feel, and it will not cut through the way it does, and it will not be as musically connected with the band, because this is the history of guitar amplification starts with a tube power amp. Some cable is dying. I'm, I'm on zero. It must be the mixing board. Maybe just kill. Ah, okay. I think it's time to say bye-bye <laughs> because the studio is kind of wrecking up. And by the way, we have funny weather outside too. This is thunderstorm Germany. We had some beautiful day, but then we had some rain and stuff. So it's kind of spooky. Hey guys. This has been great. Thank you for tuning in and um, you will see those at your local dealers very soon. I see you next week, next Wednesday, 7 p.m. German time and enjoy the hum. Bye bye. <laughs> okay, ihr habt es verdient. Ein schönes Lied zum Abschluss muss sein.